Hello, my name is Alan Foom, and today I'm going to talk about where new hydrocarbons are going to come from. So you're thinking, what? New hydrocarbons? Thought the age of oil and gas was over. Thought we didn't need any new hydrocarbons. We've got plenty. Well, not so fast. So we're going to look here at this chart, and this chart shows both demand, potential demand forecasts, which are the lines, and potential supply forecasts, which are the bars. And demand forecasts from Shell and BP that are fairly representative of all the other forecasters. So you've got BP's net zero pathway, BP's rapid transition, and these are some forecasts from Shell and BP for effectively evolving transition, business as usual, and then potentially growth as a Shell's mountain scenario. So you can see this actually pretty wide range of forecasts. It's kind of difficult planning these things as to knowing where these things will be. And here we have potential supply forecasts. So the blue bars are from Equinor, a uh, Norwegian energy company formerly known as Statoil, and they have a zero supply growth scenario. So this effectively is we've got existing projects, we just keep those chugging, no new investment. So you can see a fairly rapid fall off in supply under those circumstances. So we need to keep investing to keep things up. The orange is also from Equinor, and this is with some investment in existing projects. You can still see there's a gap. And then the gray is uh, from McKinsey using a slightly different but similar scenario. So you can see in almost all cases, for everything apart from net zero, we will have a gap between demand and supply. So we need to find new hydrocarbons to bridge that gap, even in a rapid transition scenario. And spoiler alert, we're not on the net zero pathway. We're somewhere around here. So demand over 20 years past and future. So the pink bar, the future bar here, is all the oil that was consumed between 2000 and 2019 over the last 20 odd years. And these are forecasts for the next 20 years. And you can see in all cases, including all the rapid transition cases that are realistic, we will have more hydrocarbons being consumed in next 20 years than we consumed in the last 20 because of growth mainly in the non-OECD countries. There's decline in OECD, but that's more than made up for by India, China and others. The new hydrocarbons that we need to find need to be advantaged. Now, I've got a video on my channel talking about what advantaged hydrocarbons are. And basically, an advantage oil barrel has a premium in terms of several factors as far as the market, politics, society are concerned. And these factors would be things like cost, community involvement, working closely with communities to ensure things are done well, environmental, so less fugitive methane, less flaring, like you see here, investment profile and timing, scalability, so looking at shale, oil and gas in America from drilling pad versus a whopping great FPSO. Now, you might well need both but this is a bit easier to uh, to work with in terms of uh, scaling than, uh, than this is. Fiscal terms, so this is from the UK with widely varying fiscal terms, which is not a good thing for, uh, for oil and gas companies. We do want stability. We don't mind it high as long as it's stable and then thorny issue of politics. Obviously, need to have an advantaged barrel and have a video explaining what all these things are. So new hydrocarbons, how do we get there? Well. There a, was a post on LinkedIn a few weeks back by a geologist called Joshua Turner and generated a fair amount of comment. And his basic ideas, which I've sheltered up here, are new geology, new ideas, new technology, new access and politics, and also add incremental growth in existing plays. So in terms of better recovery factors, in terms of small fields that you tie into infrastructure, etc., which add you quite a bit of value. Okay, well, how do you go about doing that? So new geology, new ideas. Well, we've had new ideas since, uh, well, 19th century. An American uh, geologist, Wallace Pratt, said, you know, oil is found in the minds of humans. And humans have been pretty inventive. Now, some of those ideas work. Many of them don't, but you've got to try in order to succeed. So I'll give you some examples of uh, where things are. Now, uh, Eddie Ong is a, an American uh, geologist who publishes quite a lot of things on, on the Internet. And he published an atlas of recent discoveries. So um, here's a a page which he did on the Buzios discovery in the pre-salt in Brazil. So this was when the South Atlantic broke up in the uh, mid-Cretaceous. We had this carbonate layer which is sealed by salt and there's a source rock underneath that. Now when we drilled into that in the first place we thought it was going to be sandstone. It turned out to be a carbonate. That was one heck of a surprise. But we've got a whole series of fields in this basin that have added a heck of a lot of value to the Brazilian economy and Brazilian society. So new ideas new plays, new areas. This is another play, which is uh, a new play that has been the best, biggest discoveries of the last 10 odd years. So this is Lisa in Guyana and, and its satellites. These are Cretaceous turbidites, uh, sandstones in de deposited in deep water uh, that were found using amplitude anomalies. This is ExxonMobil with the company leading it with um, 
Hess and Sinoc as, as their partners. Ghana's been the news ladies because Venezuela sort of has decided to claim half of it. Uh, but again, having new people in, new ideas coming together to generate potential wealth, and that's going to be a transformative thing for Guyana. Another example is Namibia. Now, um, a couple of years back at a Petex conference, had Tony Eunice from Impact Oils gave a presentation on this, and I thought, God, looks wonderful. This looks almost too good to be true. Well, it turned out to be true. So uh, you have a basin floor fan. So again, this is turbidite, steep water sandstones. You can see these dipping reflectors, uh, seaward dipping reflectors. So you're now over oceanic crust. Again, okay, found using amplitude anomalies. Some very good play fair work by Impact. Um, subsequently bought into by Shell, by Total, and this has now become the latest hot play over the last couple of years. Another interesting analogue of new plays, this time a new play in an old basin, is Johan Sverdrup in Norway. So this is a basin all high. You have a thin layer of sandstone over there, over the top of it. Uh, people kind of thought, well, yeah, uh, maybe there's sand, maybe there isn't sand. Someone drilled it. It worked. Massive development. Developed in a really interesting and innovative way by Equinor. Really an example of how to do things. And then another new play, uh, again, this was a bit of a surprise, which is Zor in the Mediterranean off the coast of Egypt, so located here, so that's Egypt. So these are some discoveries in, uh, on the Israeli side, um, but Zor is an unusual place, a carbonate uh, platform on a basement high. Now, kind of people looked at the seismic, they mistook it for an undersea volcano, turned out to be a carbonate platform. There are several similar ones that would have been discovered over the border in Cyprus, and there's a few other ones in Egypt. Uh, so again, Novel play, E and I in this case took uh, the brave decision to try to drill that. So again, new ideas at work. Now, plenty of ideas don't, but if you have new ideas, some of them will do. Some of them will be very successful. Next one is new access. Uh, so areas that have been previously closed to politics or conflict become open. Um, you have IOCs versus NOCs. Also, you have situations where you previously had a national monopoly, such as a national oil company, and you have new entrants with new ideas, new money, new technology coming in. Yeah, and you'd obviously have reasonable uh, and fair taxation regulation. Security conflict um, is a struggle. And territorial disputes resolution through, for example, joint development areas. So the examples, Mexico, Brazil, Israel, India, have had new entrants, uh, possibly in the future, Som uh, Somalia and uh, Gaza Marine, which I was involved in during my career. So this is an example for Mexico. So this is... Um, Zama, again, you've got turbidites, you've got uh, lovely amplitude anomalies, various pictures of that, you can see called water contact and the brightening. Now, Mexico had a monopoly on upstream activity uh, given to Pemex, the national oil company. Uh, they've had entry of uh, foreign uh, foreign players, foreign players have come in with new ideas. Uh, there have also been Mexican domestic companies that have involved new discoveries. New technology. Now, new technology can open up new resources um, due to finding stuff, so that's imaging. Uh, new seismic uh, control source electromagnetic, new drilling technologies, uh, production technology techniques, links to markets. So you have shale oil and tidal oil, for example, North America, high pressure, high temperature, deep water, floating LNG to access markets that were previously closed, extended reach drilling from land that can access difficult to reach places, for example, in Sakhalin or even off the coast of Dorset in England. Again, so new technology adds new resources, adds new idea, uh, and enables new ideas to take place. So here's an example from the Barents Sea in Norway, um, uh, Johan Karlsberg. Again, two key things here that in this example, again, also from Eddie Ong, is this is broadband seismic. So this is a lot of much higher frequency content than conventional seismic, leading to much higher resolution, leading to potentially identifying traps that you couldn't previously see before. And also control sorcery electromagnetics. Uh, so Oil is resistive to electrical current, water is conductive. So this is a way to try to confirm whether oil or gas exists in uh, particular traps. It's not foolproof, but it's it's relatively inexpensive and helps reduce exploration risk. And these uh, features help find new resources, help develop new resources. So this is a map from Eddie uh, about recent new oil, dis oil and gas discoveries. So you can see quite a lot of dots there, still quite a lot of activity, but we're not quite finding enough. So we're consuming about 36, barrel, 36 million barrels of oil per year, and this is what we're finding. So in a few years, we find what we consume, but generally we're living off past resources. 
Now, oil reserves have, uh, have not gone down because of new innovation to try to increase recovery, but we still need new hydrocarbons. Okay, well, what are the challenges? Well, quite a few challenges. Politics and economics always gets in the way of things. Armed conflict, resource nationalism, territorial disputes, and also funding, getting, getting uh, money to do, to do this. Consolidation within industry, fewer players, and then um, geopolitical conflicts between normal, nor global north and global south. Now, what's happening? Major IOCs shunning exploration, some yes, some no. North American large caps staying at home, focusing on shale. They've traditionally done quite a lot of work internationally, quite successfully. And will NOCs go international? Well, some like Petronas and uh, CNOC have already done so, and done so quite successfully. And I have a video on NOCs on my channel. So again, quite a few problems to solve. Uh, new technology, well, people will adopt it. Well, there's some conservatism, consolidation contractors. That's been a big problem. Slim margins for contractors cost a lot of money to develop these things, and uh, if the re returns aren't that high, will it happen? There's some resource-rich nations, for example, Russia, have been affected by sanctions. They get around things, both through internal innovation and, and other things, but again, what will happen? And what new technologies in the pipeline? And then the spread of unconventional type oil developments worldwide hasn't really happened because of various factors uh, so much so far, but taking off in Argentina might be taking off in China. What will happen in Russia? And the new geology, well, how much of the planet is left to be explored? Now, on the map previously, doesn't seem to be that much there few new frontiers left. So will the new ideas be tested and will they be successful? We don't know. But we need to overcome these challenges because humanity needs hydrocarbons in order to survive. And the hydrocarbons need to be done responsibly, need to be cleaner. So uh, fewer environmental incidents, better community relations, they need to be safer. You know, oil is a very hazardous business and we need to do things safely. It needs to be greener, it needs to be cheaper. So this is an example of a, um, of a graph showing uh, carbon intensity of uh, oil and gas developments. You can see Johan Swerdra mentioned earlier, very little in terms of uh, hydrocarbons that are uh, in terms of CO2 and other greenhouse gases which are produced during the development. Obviously you have scope three emissions, what people do with it, but we try to, but we try to control, do the thing we can control, which is scope one and scope two, which are the emissions due to our own activities. So we need to progress into the future, do things right, do things safe, do things effectively to go forward with humanity. So thank you very much. Please like, please subscribe, and I'll see you on the next one.